very happy to kick off our talks this year um, with uh, a special guest, Ruben Oslin, the director of The Square. Uh, this film, as you might have heard, was the Palme d'Or winner at the Cannes Film Festival. Um, it doesn't always happen that um, juries at big film festivals um, take a risk and also get it right, which is something that I think they did this year. Um, uh, so we're really thrilled to be giving this film its New York premiere. Um, thank you to the film's distributor, Magnolia. Um, we're happy to be opening the film as well on October 27th. Uh, so please welcome the director of The Square, Ruben Osland. <laughs> Um, I should say, it's great to have you back, because we did a complete retrospective of your films here two years ago, including your ski videos, which we showed in this very space. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. So, um, th this is um, I, maybe slightly awkward timing, because the film hasn't shown yet. Um, uh, how many people are going to see it later tonight? Great. There's also a screening on Sunday, um, and as I mentioned, we're opening in October. So, we won't give too many things away um, I about mean, the film. I think it's quite... Uh, it's don't you think that we're looking at cinema in a slightly different way today? You know, that uh, in, the way, in the same way that we're looking at a YouTube clip, you know, yeah. the title of the clip is, is actually telling us what we are supposed to see, and then we rather want to see how it is done, you know, in which way do you have directed it. And uh, so I don't have any problem with spoilers, but it, if you have <laughs> problem with spoilers, we can skip them. Should we take a vote? Or <laughs> 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 I'm n I don't know that it how I mean I don't know that it's a film. Well, actually, I do, do think it's a film that you can spoil. Yeah. I think I think the film could be spoiled because there is so okay. many. <laughs> it is quite dependent on okay. surprise. Okay. Well, let's see. What? <laughs> Who wants? Don't, don't spoil. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know. Well, like, we won't we won't go out of our way to spoil it, but we we it, it um, hopefully it won't happen. Um, I wanted to talk about um, Cannes um, uh, and winning the Palme d'Or. Uh, it was quite um, a memorable acceptance speech. People can see it on, on YouTube, your favorite platform. Um, <laughs> uh, the last time you were here, I remember that you were also up for um, a, a Best Foreign Film Oscar. Uh, you were on the shortlist, but ended up not being nominated. And you made a great video yeah. about your... Uh, Profound disappointment. You remember the title? Um, no. Swedish director freaks out when he misses out on Oscar nomination. <laughs> <laughs> Perfectly titled. <laughs> yeah, that's actually that was actually the, yeah, and we had the world premiere of that film uh, here. Like I think the evening <laughs> after you <laughs> made it. Um, but anyway, so you can was I assume a very different experience in terms of actually being up for a major prize and 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 winning it. I don't know how how you felt going into it. My sense was this was actually kind of a risky um, palm door, a pretty bold choice for the jury. Um, films that are funny don't often win prizes um, in film festivals. So I don't know what your experience was, what your expectations were. Well, mm, uh, I mean when. I as soon as you have sent the film to Cannes and you're waiting for them to accept it or not, then you're super nervous about that, of course, and you're like waiting for, for their call. And uh, for us, it took like one week later. It was like the first press conference. We didn't get any uh, uh, decision from, from the jury. And one week later, after the first press conference, then we knew that we were accepted. Uh, so that was like the most nervous moment for me, really, uh, because we uh, were like, we were like already from the beginning saying we are aiming for Cannes in competition and like trying to push ourselves. I mean, I like to have uh, put up goals for myself when it comes to the movies because it's improving the way that we are working with the film together. You know, we uh, try to do as best as we can and we have to always try to compare ourselves is, is what we are doing good enough to get into that room. Uh, so I like to have those goals outspoken. Uh, so then when you get into Cannes, then you're like super happy and like you are so happy about that. Uh, so you don't care about anything else. Uh, but then when you have had a screening and you feel like the reactions of the screening is really good, then you want to have a prize. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
then you're getting like uh, immediately you 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 are like starting comparing yourself with the other films and uh, the closer you get to the uh, the award day the Sunday um, we are starting to discuss should we leave should we go home or should we wait uh, what, what are our odds um, you didn't go home right no I didn't go home so <laughs> and we are actually made a new YouTube video that is called what it's like to win the Pandora <laughs> uh, and it's when we have been filming the day when we are waiting for that call from the, the CAM committee because they always call you and say we want you to come to the to the award ceremony and that day was a really really nervous day of course and we were like down at the beach and all of us like it was me the, the French producer and the, and the Swedish producer Eric uh, and as soon as someone got a call it's like who was that you know more and more disappointed and more and more nervous and but finally we got that call and then you were super happy again <laughs> and when you get to the award ceremony then you are starting to be nervous when they're handing out the first prize and they say that the first prize is a script prize, that is a split prize between two directors. And then you think, oh no, I'm going to get that. I'm going to share the script prize with Georgios Latimus or someone like that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 then you get really, then you want to go to Palm, of course, immediately. Uh, but uh, so it goes very quickly from being humble and like proud to, to you know, being greedy. Uh, and then in the end, when when there only was one prize left and then you almost starting to think it must be some kind of mistake you know maybe maybe they have done a mistake because we have talked about a story about um, what was the name Wars with Bashir because that director he was called back from Tel Aviv and said you have to come to the prize ceremony in Cannes and then he was sitting there and they were handing out prize after prize and finally it was only the golden palm left and he didn't get anything so the jury had changed their mind when he was going back to come. And we were sitting there now thinking it's going to be the same thing this time, you know. But then, then we, they announced uh, the square and yeah, and we were super happy, of course. For so a week. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about um, the film. You want to maybe set up the, the, the premise for, for people. Um, maybe you can talk about the origins because, you know, the film is about an art installation that you actually staged as an installation before you made the film. So maybe you can talk a little bit about what, what that project was. You were even bringing it up when you were here a few years ago. As, yeah. Well, um, okay, uh, first of all, it, I, I made this idea, like this uh, art installation together with a friend of mine that is Kalle Boomman, and he's a producer that have been working in the film industry in Sweden since the 60s. And I remember like around 2005 or something, he told me that he had an idea of uh, creating uh, one of the big squares in, in Stockholm. He wanted to turn that into a sanctuary, a, a free zone, uh, a place where like humanistic values uh, should be represented and uh, uh, that they should be like, the, um, yeah, that they should like affect the behavior of the people that were in the square. And he, he said one idea with, with how this square should, should work and it was like, for example, if you had a lot of luggage and you didn't want to carry the luggage, you could put the luggage on that square. It's called Nybroplan in Stockholm because there we don't steal. And I thought it, in the moment that he said that, you realize it's possible. You realize it's possible to create an agreement uh, as since there are so many other agreements, uh, unoutspoken agreements in, and, and also sp outspoken agreements in the public spaces and in, for example, the sanctuary in a church or the way that we behave in a library or the way that we look on a pedestrian crossing. You know, a pedest pedestrian crossing is a quite uh, fantastic um, human invention with a couple of lines in the street we have made a super strong agreement that the cars should be careful with the, with the pedestrians. So when he talked about this, this uh, you know, social contract that he wanted to build in, in that place, uh, it was, he was like, you know, you, suddenly you start to look a little bit higher than you do uh, and not like you just look around you. He, he actually had a, a, a suggestion for something uh, that I thought was great. And um, 
Then when I made a film that was called Play, that also was screened at New York Film Festival in 2011. Uh, and Play was about uh, real events that took place in Gothenburg, the city where I live in, 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 in Sweden. Uh, and it was about a group of very young boys robbing other young boys in, a, in the center of the city in a mall. Uh, and these robberies took place like for almost three years or something. Uh, and I read through the court files, and it was over 60 different cases. And when I read those court files, you could tell that it was very, very seldom that any adults was interacting with the robberies. And I mean, these boys, they were around 12 to 14 years old, so they were quite small. And the robberies took place in a mall, and there was a lot of adults around them. But, but it was very seldom. It was like only two uh, occasions where an adult uh, tried to stop the robberies. And uh, the kids that were robbed, they didn't ask for help either. So it was almost like, uh, like the adult's world and the kid's world were taking place on two parallel levels. And when I was working with the film, I, I, I started to talk to my father about this. And he is brought up in, in Stockholm during the 50s. And he told me that when he was like six years old and he was supposed to go out and play, uh, his parents put an address tag around his neck and wrote the address to, uh, to where he lived and sent him out on the streets all alone. And it was so obvious when he said that, that in the 50s you looked at other adults as someone that would help your children if they ended up in trouble. You look at, you also the social contract was like, as an adult, you have responsibility for uh, all, all children in society in some ways. And if I look at how I bring up my children today and the general like, idea about the public spaces and how we look on other adult people in, in, in when I'm, my kids are meeting adult people in the city, it's almost that we bring them up with the idea that other adult is a possible threat them. So it had been like a, a huge attitude change, and this is with, without that the society had become more dangerous or more criminal or anything, at least in these parts of the city. So, and this was one thing that affected me, that like this attitude change or the idea about the social contract uh, had changed. And then I talked to another friend of mine that is a journalist, and he was doing, um, he was doing it a TV show about a, a phenomenon or two uh, uh, phenomena that was existing or like are starting to exist in Sweden right now. And one of the phenomena is a gated community. There are this, this is quite seldom, so it's not like it, it's like you shouldn't exaggerate that there's a lot of gated communities or anything like that, but they have started to build a couple of gated communities in Sweden. And I mean, a gated community is a very aggressive way of saying um, behind the fence, uh, this around this fence, this is where I, my responsibility is. And what is outside of the fence is something that I consider as a threat. Uh, and it's not my responsibility. And he wanted to put this phenomenon towards a phenomenon in the other part of the city where there are groups of people that call themselves mafia. And I mean, mafia is um, a way of saying we don't accept the rules and the laws of this society. Uh, we, we have our own uh, rules, uh, rules and laws. And then he was asking himself, what is left in between? Where is, the, where is that common project? Where is, the, um, uh, where is our agreement on the laws of the state and, and our belief in, in, like, in the national state and things like that? And in this context, I, got, I started to remember like, the idea that my friend Kalle had about like, this sanctuary to build like, a, a square where we are reminded about a certain kind of behavior and, and these values. And now it came back in a, different, in, in a different shape. And this time it came back like a white marked square uh, that was more comparable with a pedestrian crossing. So that with a couple of white lines in the street, you, you, you should build an agreement that if someone is standing in the square, it's my obligation to address this person because then I can go, how can I help you? I can see that you are standing in the square. So in, in some ways, uh, a place where we could break the bystander effect and where we could be reminded of, of, of our role as a fellow human being 
and yeah, so so that was actually the starting point. So you you made a few of these squares in Sweden and Norway, right? Mm. Can, you, can you tell us what happened in in? Um, it was quite fun, you know. In the first one, we built in Värnamo at the same time as we had uh, an art exhibition about this idea or this concept. And the first thing that happened uh, was actually uh, we had a sign just next to the square where it says the square is a sanctuary, a zone of trust and care. Within it bounds, we share equal rights and obligations. And that copper plate got stolen after one day <laughs> or something like that. So it was very bizarre. Um, but they, they restored it and they put it back. And in Värnamo, I mean, it's interesting with a smaller city because in Värnamo it almost have become a little bit of a movement because there's a lot of different institutions in the city and, and uh, like the, the, the boss of culture in that city that have embraced this idea. And for example, the police are taking school kids to the, to this, uh, to the square and talking about like values, how we should treat each other. Um, there have been a group of functionally handicapped people that have had a demonstration because they lo lost the benefit from, from the state. And then they wait, went to the square and had a demonstration. And when it was the terror event in Stockholm, uh, then they had a manifestation against violence. Um, and there was also some, not a school shooting, but some school murders in Sweden. And then they used it again as a manifestation place. And every time the local newspaper came and took a picture of it. Yeah. So, I mean, in, in some ways it's uh, it ha actually worked as like a symbolic place where, where, where the people of Värnamo is reminded about uh, uh, another kind of behavior or reminded of like humanistic values. So the square as it, you know, as it played out in these real squares and these installations, it seems like there's something quite kind of idealistic about what, what, is, what is an operation here, this idea of like reminding people of the social contract and conducting what is really, I think, a, a kind of um, idealistic social experiment. But in the film, it's a little bit different. I mean, without giving too much away to okay. people, you've made the film, the, the, the protagonist of your film is a, a contemporary art curator, um, and this is the new installation that he is about to unveil, but things don't go well, <laughs> let's say. Um, and, uh, and I feel like the film has, um, it's interesting, I feel like there's these dueling impulses um, in, maybe in your work as well. There's this idealism about the square and what it can stand for, and then there's also like a cynicism um, mm. about, you know, which I think is also very evident in the film, you know, because, Right, I mean, like, I don't want to, you know, talk about specific things in the film, but like, uh, what happens to the character and and and, and this project um, is is um, not as you just described with these uh, real life squares that you built in. No, but I can I, I can talk a little bit what happened when I tried to talk to journalists about this idea. Uh, um, I mean, the reaction that I that I met was quite much like, oh, that's very nice, you know. But it did, yeah, I didn't get any response from it. Everybody agrees, like, this is a nice idea. But also they say it's idealistic. Uh, and, they, um, and I had the feeling, you know, that in order to get attention to, like, an altruistic idea today, it, it, it is kind of hard in that kind of media climate that we are trying to deal with. because. We wanted like the papers to write about this, uh, or, uh, like in Stockholm and Gothenburg, but the only paper that was writing about it was actually in Värnamo, this small local uh, paper. And I mean, when I was working with, like, to do a film about this, I also had a conflict in myself. How do you create a film about like just uh, this altruistic, uh, uh, symbolic place, and how do you create a conflict around it? You know, I was also looking for a conflict. In the same way that as the journalist was looking for like uh, something to you know to position themselves with, so then I decided that the film should partly be about a PR agency that is trying to promote this humanistic altruistic place uh, or this altruistic symbolic place, and they are just they are like reacting in the same way, you know. But mm, you know, why should I care? And in order to make people write something about is they need a conflict they need they need to like position themselves themselves um, and I started to you know look at 
other phenomena that had with media to do, like for example terrorism uh, that have gotten so much attention in media uh, and uh, like, the, like this sensational uh, seeking of, of news that, that media is constantly doing um, and was quite inspired of also how some politicians uh, uh, were talking about the problem of getting attention in media. Because I think it's interesting with democracy, you know, that in order to get elected, you need to get attention. And in order to get attention today, you really need to look for a conflict. You ha have to have a, like a radical message. And there's so many examples of that. Uh, if you lo look at many different elections. But it was like one party in, in Sweden that was called the Pirate Party that was like dealing with um, uh, sharing on internet. And this, the, the party leader, does, he said something quite interesting. He said, from one election to another, they almost didn't get any attention at all. And he was like saying, well, we have even tried to say that we are pro-legalization for marijuana, but no one is writing about us anyway. So you can really tell that they are like going for like controversial topics uh, in order to try to get attention. And, and you can really say that it has been working very well for extreme right-wing parties in Sweden. They have got a lot of attention. And if you look at the measure of articles, like the percentage of articles that have been written about them, it, it's very comparable with the amount of votes that they get. And I think that we have like an idea that human being is a rational creature. That we are like, we are processing this info and then we are doing a rational decision. But I think that we are much more of an imitating creature. So what gets into our mind is also uh, then a possibility for us to either go against or go with. And um, um, yeah, so, so, so in order then to, to promote an altruistic, humanistic idea, then I have to tell something, a little bit uh, from the film yeah. this. This PR agency creates a YouTube clip uh, that is going the complete opposite direction and doing something very cynical instead and they succeed so media goes straight into the trap and start writing about um, uh, this altruistic idea because of this so at one level of the film is really is really trying to discuss this this, this media climate mm -hmm. um can you talk a little bit about your your relationship with the art world, specifically with the you know contemporary art world? I mean, the film is is I, I think a very uh, sort of funny uh, and pretty I think detailed sort of um, portrait of um, almost like kind of has ethnographic level detail of like the the world of the curator, the world of the art opening, of the black tie gala, and all that you know all that. Was this something that you? are familiar with? Is this something that you researched or...? I mean, when I decided that the film should take place in an, in an art museum, uh, that was at the same time that we was invited to making an art exhibition in Van Moe, where mm -hmm. they also built the first square. And uh, uh, then, I mean, uh, then I was traveling around uh, a little bit in the world, visiting different contemporary art museums. And what you can tell is that, I mean, MoMA have set a certain kind of standard that everyone else is trying to copy almost. That's, that's the feeling of it. And a lot of the museums is looking in, in the quite same way. You know, you have a neon sign on the wall, you have a war hole, you have a Giacometti, and a couple of objects on the floor. And I think that the, the t tradition that, that a little bit have influenced the art world today is maybe when Duchamp put the pissoir into the white cube. And I mean, when, when he put the uh, pissoir into the white cube, it was also a provocation towards that room. People got like, what, what are you doing? Like, is this an art piece? But that have become like a ritual and almost a convention. So it's repeating itself. And now the object, it's really hard to exhibit an object in, in the white cube in order to raise new thoughts and, 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 and to get connection with the world outside the walls of, of, of the museum. Um, but at the same time, I must say, you know, that uh, the arena of contemporary art is also the, the place where they actually accepted this idea of the square the first, 
the f they were the first institu institution to actually, ah, this is a great idea, let's exhibit it. So it is a place where we have the possibility to talk about, like think outside of the box and talk about what kind of society do we want and um, yeah, ask ourselves existential questions. So, so the art arena uh, was also the, the thing that created the possibility to build this one also then in, in a square outside of the museum. Um, but I think, I mean, I'm, I'm a professor at the university in Gothenburg in directing, and uh, there's also a program for contemporary art. And um, for you that is going to look at the film, there's a text in the beginning that Elizabeth Moss' character is reading for the chief curator. That is, I, can't, I can't quote it 100%, but it goes like, exhibition, non-exhibition, an inquiry into ideas of the exhibitable. You know, it's like blue, 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 blue. It's like really corporate art bullshit. And that kind of theory, at least in Europe, is really, really uh, a problem for, for, for the art world, I would say. Uh, because it's, it's, a, it's a kind of theory that is inspired from the Goldsmiths University uh, and a way of talking about art that is on a like, very, very like, quasi uh, advanced level. And then the student that is in these art schools that is trying to create art, they first are starting to theorize about their art and then they are starting to cre create. So it's almost like a wet blanket over them. So I, I see that that is like making the art scene less vital, I would say. I, I want to ask you a few questions about your, your process. Um, maybe we can start by talking about, about writing. Um, how long did it take you to write this, this script in particular? It's, I think it's, it's a pretty complex, intricate, like ambitious piece. I mean, I feel like even, even I remember you talking about you know, your original ideas um, two years ago and then seeing the finished film, it is like so much more complex um, and far reaching than that. So I'm wondering how long you take um, and do your ideas, you know, do you like revise scripts as you write as, as, as new ideas come in or, or, or is it all pretty fully formed at the beginning? I, <coughs> I think I do like this that when I've decided like the film should be about the same kind of questions and thematic as the symbolic place the square is like making us thinking about, uh, then, then I'm starting a period when I'm just only collecting ideas and scenes and things that I think is connected with that thematic. And then I'm like starting to talk to a lot of people about, about the, the content of the film. And uh, uh, yeah, one scene that you will see in the film, uh, a friend told me, uh, and I can just give an example because it's so much about creating a dialogue with other people for me in order to understand what I want to, to put in the film. And she told me like that outside her apartment there's a beggar uh, that sits there like on a daily basis and she gives this beggar like a couple of coins every day. And one day when she uh, is like coming to the beggar and she says like I'm sorry but I don't have any cash on me but I can buy a sandwich to you in, in, the, in the cafeteria. And the beggar goes, yes, uh, chicken ciabatta, please. <laughs> and she's suddenly, you know, like, do you have demands on me? You know, you should stay on your position where you are and I should be up here. And that conflict in her was like so interesting. Uh, and when she's starting to walk to the caf cafeteria, you can, the beggar is uh, like uh, calling after her, hey, no onion. <laughs> <laughs> and, that makes a really, really interesting setup for me, and I immediately because then you have like the conflict in in that situation ma makes it interesting, and in how we are trying to deal with 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 that kind of setup. When someone is lowering yourself and asking you for something, it's also so obvious that okay, I can give you something as long as you are like lower than me in the hierarchy, and that is a typical scene that I just put into the film immediately. And you will, yeah, the one of you that is going to the screening will see. It. So you, you do take a lot from uh, observation, anecdote. I mean, you've mentioned a few scenes now that you've described actually as things that you've taken from your friends' experiences. Yeah. <laughs> Some of the most uncomfortable and embarrassing yeah, scenes Yeah, it's a in scene the film. called the condom scene that you, yeah. <laughs> but I will leave it at that, but yes. Um, 
I, I want to talk about the, the process in terms of, of shooting. Um, you have talked a lot about how you really value um, long shoots um, and just the luxury of having many takes. Um, and I feel like in this film especially, you really have some very uh, long sequences. Um, and can you talk about like why you like how you know why you like to work with your actors and and your crew that way? Well, one thing that I think um, has been important to me is like you know, uh, at least in the in, in the square, it's like uh, combining longer sequences, but with also with dynamics. So you, when you push up in the, into the film and trying to not only go for a really slow phase, but also have a phase that is changing and, and, and creating a dynamic in. But I think that, you know, for an example, I think it was interesting when Elizabeth Moss was uh, coming to the shooting and I had met her on a casting session in London and I tried to explain to her in which way I work because I, I mean, I do in average maybe 40 takes or something I would guess. So we don't have more than maybe two camera positions each day in order to be able to concentrate on what's happening in front of the camera and not only have like a logistic problem of moving the camera around all the time. Because I think a lot about the shooting when you go to many productions, they don't have that much time to focus on, on the thing going on when the camera is recording. Um, so I want to try to create a, a shooting where, okay, this is the image that we're going to work with. And uh, like in the end of the day, uh, I will go, you know, after repeating over and over and over again, I will go, everybody ready? Five takes left. And then we start a countdown. And now it's four takes left. And in order to try to build in an intense feeling on set, and combining that with that uh, we have made really, really precise, how do you say, schedule or uh, a very precise way of maneuvering in the scene and a very precise way of, uh, with all the details and things like that. And combining that with creating uh, uh, an intense feeling, like almost like it's an important football game going on. You know, now we have to win this game and now with four takes left and then you do the count on. And very often it's like one of the last two takes that I'm, that I'm using, uh, one of these last five takes, but very often the second last take actually is the one that I think raises above, it's strange. And, and during the day, you know, in the beginning, I always feel like when you have a camera that is positioned in, w in, in one position and you're, or, and you're capturing the scene in real time, then you're going to meet a lot of problems because as soon as something is not authentic, you will detect it immediately. And on set, I never give me the ability of, okay, I will fix that in, in the editing. Because I want to create something that is organic to happen in front of the camera. So then I have to start to work with, like, is something that is not working in the script. Uh, because also as soon as you see the image, you, you have a certain different kind of elements to deal with than if you have, a, like, a paper product. And finally, you find maybe a pattern that is like good and you, you take away some things and you add other things. And then you can try out the scene and the actors can try out the scene in a way that is a little bit more, they can take risks. They can do things that they wouldn't dare to do if we only had five takes. And then they can do things that like, is almost silly or, you know, and like, but suddenly it's like, wow, that's, that's silly, but it's also brilliant. It's going to work really, really well in the scene. And then we can keep it. And then we start repeating, and then it goes like, oh, it's getting better and better and better. And suddenly it's like, oh no, it's getting worse. What's <laughs> happening now? <laughs> and then you are so scared of that you're not able to push up uh, the quality of the scene again. Uh, and sometimes you don't manage, you know? So sometimes you put like one third of the day, but you never reach higher in that point than you did like after the half day. And that's a very painful shooting when, when you don't reach above that level. But quite often we, we manage to go up again and suddenly we are above the level when, when before we were starting to go down. And then I take that like, like a one hour break or something. And then when we get back, then we, let, okay, let's go for the five last takes. Um, and for actors, it's of course, if you are not used to this kind of method, method of shooting, then you are exploding in the beginning of the day. And you're like pushing in everything in the beginning of the day. And then you don't have the energy left in the end of the day. 
So as an actor, you have to also be be, um, be aware of that you should save some energy. And I think both Dominique West and Elizabeth Moss uh, had a little bit of struggle in, with this in the beginning. I think they are used to a different kind of production. Uh, I'm just going to ask you one more question um, before we open it up to the audience. And I think this is like kind of a key question with with your cinema and certainly with this film and this, this central character. Um, and which is sort of your your attitude, like your stance towards your characters, because um, you know you are often very strongly critical um, of your characters. Um, you often make f fun of them in some ways, but, but there is a way in which you never, I feel at least, that you never quite lose um, just this basic idea of empathy, simply because. When I see your films, I feel like there's a sort of a mirror effect. You know, it's always like bouncing back on the audience in terms of like asking them what they would do in that situation. And I feel like that is maybe key, and maybe the humor is also key. I, I ask because you're often compared to, I don't think it's maybe the best comparison, but you're often compared to Michael Haneke. Um, I think partly because he's a very analytical filmmaker, and his films have a sort of sociological interest, which you share. Um, but I also feel like tonally your films are very different. And this idea of like your attitude to your filmmakers is something that also comes up a lot with, with Hanukkah. So where do you stand you know, with these people you are critiquing, making fun of? Well, I, I, I've quite often also heard that I am compared with Larry David. I think that's more accurate. <laughs> <laughs> so a combination of Hanukkah and Larry David. <laughs> because what I think that it's... Uh, it, what I think, I like stand-up comedy quite much. You know, that stand-up comedian, they are so skillful in taking a situation and making a strong relationship between that situation and the audience. And then they are asking the audience, like, how would you react? And they are very good in, uh, in putting up dilemmas. You know, that you have two or more choices to deal with a, uh, with a situation, but none of them are easy. And all of the choices will create consequences. And it was quite fun because I was having dinner with Larry David and a couple of other of the, these people when I was in LA. And you, you could tell what they were doing all the time was like testing their material, you know, on each other. And like, I have to tell you what I was experiencing the other day. And, they, and they, it's like a little, how do you say, stage when, they, when they're testing their material. And I'm, I'm really, really doing it the same, same way. I'm, I'm like stealing situations that friends have been into, um, talking about my own life and I have to tell you about this awkward situation that I were into and trying to figure out how I should direct it really. And, but at the same time I can relate to Mikkel Hannek, yeah, because I think that he's, he always have, um, he always puts the character into uh, a context, he always puts them into, um, how do you say, uh, uh, a setup, and he has a, a kind of, you know, he doesn't blame the characters. He he put the, the characters. He has a materialistic point of view on the characters. Their actions is dependent on where they are in a certain kind of position in society, and etc. etc. So, and and very very often, I when I'm directing, I always try to think. Would it be possible for me to react in the same way as the, as the characters are, are doing now? And if the answer is no, then it's something that is wrong with the setup. Because I have to be able to relate with the character's actions as a human being, rather than like looking at the main character in the square, for example, as a very specific character, and he's strange, and that's why he's reacting in that way. Uh, I have to be able to relate to, to what he's doing. So. So Larry David has seen your films? No. <laughs> we should try to get him to. Um, I think we have time for two or three questions from the audience. Uh, and we also have mics. So raise your hand if you have a question for Ruben. Hi, Ruben. This situation that you described a moment ago with the um, homeless person making a demands on this person is just fascinating to me. And I'm, I'm thinking about it. And I can't help thinking that there's a power dynamic anytime you have two human beings in any kind of interchange. Um, and the situation that you described is a very extreme example of a power dynamic. Do you think about this idea of a power dynamic in the films that you make and in your characters and in the, the setup and the social structure? 
uh, in which way I'm interested in it or in which way I'm trying to explore it or sorry I in your yeah in generally in my films okay mm. Mm. okay I can tell you something that is about the next film that I'm uh, supposed to do <laughs> that is a spoiler then on the next movie <laughs> okay so it takes place on a on a luxury cruising ship that is sailing around in the Caribbean and it's like a six-star luxury floating hotel and it has the richest people like on the planet is going on these trips and they actually exist and on this boat it's like a, a miniature uh, society you have these billionaires and also you have the crew and on this boat it's a 55 year old cleaning lady uh, a Filipino cleaning lady and then you have the billionaires and Russian risk capitalists and old British money etc etc but um, uh, like there's there's they are getting hijacked by Somalian pirates <laughs> 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 um, and we are not going to follow when they are hijacked but we are going to follow a couple of people that managed to get on shore on a deserted island and it's the Filipino cleaning lady it's a male model <laughs> it's, it's a couple of bi the billionaires and now the hierarchy is flat but the Filipino cleaning lady, she knows how to fish. So she's catching up fish of the fish of the fish, you know. And she also knows how to cook. And suddenly the billionaires are talking very socialistic. You know, it's very important that we share, share the resources. <laughs> <laughs> they are becoming very socialistic, you know. And uh, uh, the male model, you know, he had his value in his looks. What should he do with his value now on the island? And one night when they are sitting around the campfire and this 55-year-old Filipino cleaning lady is sitting there and giving fish to everybody sitting around the fire and they are so hungry, you know. Yeah. Suddenly she sees this like Aryan 1.90 uh, <laughs> model starting to flirt with her. <laughs> and I think we have seen quite many scenes or not a couple of scenes at least when women go like this towards a man, you know, you have access. This time we're going to see this man, this male model, looking at this Filipino 55-year-old cleaning lady and going like this, you have access. <laughs> so they become a couple. <laughs> and I think we have seen quite many images of a very young, beautiful woman uh, next to an older man. And we have no problem with that at all. We understand the setup. But we haven't seen that many images of a 25-year-old beautiful man with a 55-year-old Filipino cleaning lady that is like 1.50. But I want them to make out, have sex, you know, <laughs> really go into uh, in how that, that images will affect us. And maybe he's also saying, I love you. And he means it, you know, I love you. Why didn't I see, did I see your qualities before? Yeah. So from going from a patriarchy, we are going into a matriarchy. It, exactly, and the, the power shift is completely turned over. And can I tell you the end of the film? Because it would be so fun to tell the end of the film yes. also. Okay. <laughs> One day, the Filipino cleaning lady that now has her kingdom, she is walking on this deserted island together with another person in the group, not the male mother, model, not her partner, but yeah, someone else. And they are going one day further than they have ever walked before. And when they are going around uh, the horn, they see like in the, uh, on the beach, there's a cliffside going down on the beach. And there's like, is it a door? And when they get closer, they see it's an elevator. And next to the elevator, there's a sign where it says, Sunny Beach Five Star Le Luxury Resort. <laughs> and this guy that is with the Philippine cleaning lady is like super happy. Wow, we are, get we are getting back to civilization. Yeah. We are saved. But the Philippine cleaning lady is not that happy because she's like about to lose her position again. And when they're going back and they are like, it's quite far to walk, I was thinking that they have to rest on the beach. And this, this other person is like laying down on the beach, maybe putting their hand like this. I don't know if they are sleeping, but... And then the Philippine cleaning lady sees a big rock. <laughs> and I want the film to end in the dilemma, you know. Should she kill him in order to maintain her position? Or should, he, should she like, let them go back to civilization and she loses her position in, in that hierarchy? 
So that's really, really what I, uh, 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 that film is really going to be like about power shifts and like different positions and how our behavior is very dependent on our position in a hierarchy and in an economical system also. Do you have a title yet? Uh, Triangle of Sadness. <laughs> <laughs> and I can tell you what that is. It's like when you have a wrinkle in between your eyebrows. Uh, and in Swedish it's called trouble wrinkles because you have had a lot of trouble in your life. But you can, you can fix that in 15 minutes with Botox. So. <laughs> <laughs> The geometry series. So. Uh, one more question there. Hi. You had mentioned uh, you do an excessive amount of takes. I saw a short film of yours that's just a uh, one continuous take. I was curious how many times you did that or you know, just the process of doing that. I guess you're talking about incident by a bank. Right. Uh, well, I can tell you just briefly about the background of incident by a bank because it was a failed robbery attempt that me and my producer was an eyewitness to when we were in Stockholm. Uh, and one day we see like a couple of guys coming up on a moped uh, and we are standing on a, a, like a waiting for a green light to cross over a pedestrian crossing. And I hear Eric like say to me, my friend is like, do they have like ski masks on them? Rubber masks? It's called rubber mask in Swedish. And I like look and I see under the helmets are like white masks sticking out. Uh, and I'm like, but aren't these flame-proof masks that you have when you're dealing with motor, motor sport or something like that? I'm trying to find a reason why they have these white masks on them. And the guys on the moped, they are very nervous, so they, they can't wait for a green light. So they are like starting to cross the street, and uh, suddenly they open, like they, they park the moped next to a big mall that is in Stockholm, and they open the saddle and then get out two guns from the saddle. Uh, or the saddle, uh, how do you say, um, yeah. Uh, and they go into that building and we actually are witnessing a, a robbery attempt from the beginning. And a couple of seconds later they go out, come out from the, from the entrance again and they are very confused looking up at the building and it turns out they have, that they have uh, gone into the wrong entrance. <laughs> so they are putting back the, uh, the guns in the, in the moped and they are getting up on the moped and they are like going mm very slowly, a very slow moped, not, <laughs> not a quick one at all. And they go into the main entrance and at the main entrance there's like an old man looking at them that, that have realized the same thing that we have uh, realized. And they are like going around him, parking the moped, taking out the pistols, going into the entrance and a couple of seconds later they start shooting inside. And what happens on that street is completely surreal. I thought that people would run in panic, you know, and throw themselves on the ground. Uh, but instead it's like uh, everything just continues, uh, like nothing has happened on the street. And it's a couple of backpackers that, like one of them have an ice cream in his hand and like getting closer to try to see what's happening in, inside, inside that mall. And the old man that uh, the, the robbers did go around with a moped, he's like going over to the moped place it down on the ground and get, goes back and stands where he was standing from the beginning. And it be just becomes more and more absurd, this event. And um, it's actually on, on Vimeo if you want to look at it, Incident by a Bank. But when I decided that I wanted to make a short film out of that, then there were so many trivial details that was just as important as when the guns were going off. So I felt that I have to try to capture this in a real time shot because then I will not like say this is more important than that. Then the audience have to decide what is the most important thing going on. Um, and when we shot it, we shot it with a, uh, a, a red uh, 5K red cam. Uh, so the resolution was at that time you only could project 2K. So we had 3K that we didn't do anything with. So I decided that we should try to have the camera on a fixed position and then afterwards I will do all the zooming and the camera movement in the editing. So we would do it digitally. So in that film, that the result of the film is actually a combination of four different takes even though it looks like one real time shot. Because when I'm zooming in in one part of the image and then I'm moving over on the other part of the, of the image then I can go to another take. So, uh, so we, we did 16 takes on that, on that one and, uh, 
And, and, now, and of course, when we had a possibility to change the timing and things like that in the editing, it feels like it's very, very well choreographed. Um, yeah. I'm afraid we're out of time, but um, do check out the square at the festival or when it opens October 27th. You're actually going to come back for Q&A's opening weekend, I think. Yeah, yeah. Great. So um, thank you so much, Ruben, and thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you.